welcome to Waves of YA, a podcast focused on literacy brought to you by the Ocean County Library's Team Literacy Work Group. My name is Chris. Joining me today we have... My name is Courtney. And my name is Rachel. Uh, today's episode will be focused on nonfiction reading. What do you find appealing about reading nonfiction compared to fiction? It hits a totally separate spot for me. Sometimes I just want to learn about something and I feel like YA nonfiction has a lot of really well put together specific books on specific topics that are way more accessible than other sources of information. Yeah, they're definitely like, I feel like a lot of the adult ones read as a textbook sometimes where it's like, I finished school, I don't want to go back. I just want the information. They keep it more like engaging rather than like fact, fact. But like there's plenty of like adult nonfiction that is good and engaging. But sometimes like you get the one and I'm like, no. Whereas YA tends to be like a more manageable size too. You don't need as crazy, crazy details. Like I just want the general information. If I want to go deeper, I'll dig deeper on my own. That's like a good starting point for like different topics of like, I'm interested. I don't need to know every minute detail. Right, exactly. It's reliable information and it's presented in an easy to understand way. And again, I haven't read a lot of adult nonfiction, but some of it, it really does seem, like you said, a little bit textbooky or almost like it's trying too hard to be like really formal and authoritative sounding. Whereas with YA, it's still good information, but it goes through the basics and helps you get an overview of stuff. Yeah, it's accessible and like assumes you're coming in without knowing anything too. If you don't know anything, you're fine. You don't have to have all the like jargon known already. It tells you, hey, these are the terms you're going to learn right now. There are a lot of like nonfiction books that are graphic novels too. And that kind of goes along with how we don't like things that are textbooky. It's like, well, there are nonfiction books that are graphic novels. And that makes it very appealing, too, to just read a comic book about something that's true. I absolutely love Grand Theft Horse by uh, Greg Neary, which was super fun. It was a topic I knew nothing about, about a woman that stole a um, racehorse. And it was very cool. I would have never known anything about it if like, I hadn't found it. And I was like, oh, I was interested. I dug deeper on my own. But I was like, this covered all the information and nothing else. Like, added more to it, really. And it was like a quick read on topic. It was so fun. Well, I really like digging deeper, too, with like true topics. I mean, when I saw the play Hamilton on Disney+, Plus, I really wanted to like know more about it. And there's actually like this really good nonfiction book all about the Hamilton play that was written by Lin-Manuel Miranda, going deeper into like the story of Hamilton and the play and all that good stuff. Do you by any chance remember the name of that? It's called Hamilton, and then there's like a subtitle for it. Okay. We'll find it and we'll link it. (laughs) That way, anyone that wants to check it out. It's like, Hamilton's still super popular. It's been how many years now? Hamilton is going strong. Oh, it is. (laughs) What category of nonfiction do you prefer most and why? I really like nonfiction books that almost read like they're fiction, and they could be made up stories, but they're not. One of my favorite nonfiction books is called The Pregnancy Project. And that was about a girl who, for her senior project, decided to pretend to be pregnant and kind of tackled a lot of stereotypes behind pregnant teenagers in high school. And that's a book that like could be like a made-up story, but it's not. It's a true story. I tend to go for biographies, celebrity biographies, memoirs. Anything that's a life I didn't already live, I'm like, yeah, I want to know more. And like, the celebrity biographies like are a mix of like, this is a Wikipedia, like very easy versus like really in depth. Like, all boys aren't blue. It was really, really good. Really in depth. Uh, notes for young black chefs were really, really good. Really engaging. And I really enjoyed reading them, getting to see a different perspective and someone's life that's so drastically different from mine. And that's great for teenagers, too. They're only exposed to what's around them and being able to read people's memoirs and biographies and seeing how other people live and how other people grew up and getting to see what it's like. I've got 
one that's pretty recent, 2020. And it's called True or False, a CIA analyst guide to spotting fake news. It's topical. It's informative. The way it's laid out, it addresses current events and it talks about the history of misinformation. And of course, I'm personally and professionally very interested in information literacy and this concept of fake news and how we are all consuming our information and how that can be kind of twisted for different reasons. I just think it's such an important thing for people to know. It's an important thing for young people to learn how to do. And it's very readable. It's not quite like that narrative nonfiction where it could almost be a fiction story, but it's very readable. It's got a lot of good information and it's got neat little sidebars and stuff like that to keep it engaging. So I really enjoy that. You like find a topic and this is the way to get into it. I also really like some how-to books too, or like crafting books too, because that counts as nonfiction. <laughs> that does. Oh, I really I like think about that. <laughs> Because I got a sewing machine a couple years ago, and I only used it a little bit, but I really like checking out books on sewing because it gives you all the patterns and step-by-step instructions. It's like almost 20 different patterns in one book. And to me, that's a lot easier than like scouring Pinterest and trying to find all these sewing patterns. Just check out a book on sewing and it gives you all the information right there. And Pinterest doesn't have any quality control at all. And like, it didn't even occur to me like crafting books. And I do the Crafting with Chris videos on our YouTube channel. And I, every time I'm like, here's a list of resources that we have. It's all nonfiction. (laughs) Yeah. All of our nonfiction, like crafting books are great. Like someone has already gone through them and like, does this pattern work versus Pinterest being like, man, I hope this pattern works. No, no, it doesn't. Or like every Pinterest recipe I feel like is wrong. Or I'm like, have you ever cooked chicken? Actually, I don't think you did. You wrote me a very lovely essay about your grandpa but the recipe doesn't work <laughs> so like our cookbooks too oh god not is such a huge category where it's so many different directions you can go with it something else that falls into nonfiction is poetry i love poetry and getting a really nice poetry book can just be such a great experience because obviously again similar to crafting stuff or recipes and pinterest you can find a lot of poetry freely available online but there's something to be said for having it professionally pulled together as a collection. Um, There's a recent one called Inheritance, a visual poem. And it's, it's actually the printed version of a spoken word poem. And it's got a lot of illustrations and it's a beautiful, beautiful book. And the poem it contains is also fun to read and enjoyable experience. Uh, what are some titles that you would recommend for nonfiction readers out there? Um, I had mentioned uh, Notes from a Young Black Chef by Kwame Anawachi. I feel like I'm pronouncing that wrong and I'm so sorry. But it's great. It talks about him growing up, uh, his mom cooking, learning to cook from his mom, becoming like going um, to Africa, living with his grandfather, learning how they cooked and their recipes, opening his own restaurant in D.C., and creating fine dining with African culture tied into it, and creating that space and taking up that spot and saying, like, yes, our culture and our food is valuable. It is fine dining. And it was really interesting getting to hear the stories, and then, like, also, like, he includes recipes, and I'm like, I don't actually like cooking, but I would love someone else to cook these for me. That sounds really good. The food and the book both sound i know he's like talking i'm like oh this recipe sounds great i am lazy (laughs) this is not my crafting area well one biography i really like it's called brazen rebel ladies who rock the world and i really like that one because it's a graphic novel and there's also 29 stories of just very remarkable women in it so each story is only like 10 pages long and it just gives you like the short introduction of what each woman did and how it they made their mark on history and it mentions all different women from all different backgrounds it has politicians it has entertainers it has scientists and there's a lot of women too that i've never even heard of before i mean there's a volcanologist there's 
somebody who won a Nobel Peace Prize for her work in ending the Civil War. And, you know, everybody knows about Joan of Arc and what she did on history, but there's just so many women out there that aren't in the history books and aren't in a lot of nonfiction books. So you read this short graphic novel and you just met 29 new women. Uh, And the illustrations in that are gorgeous. Like it is pretty to look at too. The color choices are all pretty pastels. Yeah, it's like a lot of pinks and blues and greens. Yeah, I'm like, oh, it's so, like, I, it came, I remember when it came in, I was like, this is so pretty. I was like, oh, it's a cool topic. Have either of you seen Creature? It's a new one by Sean Tan. No. Oh, it is gorgeous. It's kind of like a big book, not thick necessarily, but larger size. And Difficult it's... Difficult to sell. <laughs> yeah, but it's Creature paintings, drawings, and reflections. And it's just all this artwork by Sean Tan interspersed with stories about his life and his work as an artist and how he got started and how his art style developed and it is just so cool like I just flipped open a page and there's this little steampunk-ish looking creature hauling a little cart with a giant strawberry on it and it's really cool it's the sort of thing that I feel like all ages could really appreciate. I'm enjoying it and I can definitely see it being inspiring and interesting for teens, especially if they're looking to get into art. And it's so creative that I really feel like if you're trying to share it with children, maybe not the essays in it so much, but the artwork would just really catch their imagination. Wow. Do you know why he named it Creature? He's been drawing for a long time and he started as a very, very small child. I think he said three or something, which I mean, lots of people draw at three, but he was really, really into it. And he was always drawing these wild looking just creatures. Wow. I guess that was the thing that always really caught his interest. The cover, it's got this giant owl looking guy with one big eye next to a little girl holding flowers and that description sounds like it could be a little horrific but all of his stuff is so charming it all seems really friendly even when it's unusual and outlandish and has what we might think of as monstrous features for me i feel like that's part of the appeal you're taking something and it's so weird and there's so much in our society that says that things that are out of the ordinary are scary and instead it's making them like these are little buddies it's great another uh two for like our history fans out there is a pirate's life for she swashbuckling women through the ages by laura so duncombe i think there's like 30 different women pirates throughout the ages you get a little introduction to it, and like if you want more, she has an adult version called Pirate Women with a lot more like weightier information in there that's also really good. Uh, but if you're like, I just want like quick little bites of like information, she covers all the details that you need. I think I read it in a day, but like I also really love pirates, so I was like, this is great. <laughs> and another one that I read is about history is Samurai Rising, the epic life of Miyamoto Yoshitsune by Pamela S. Turner. So that's set in, um, oh, I can't remember which era of Japan, but obviously with Samurai. It's the only biography of him in English. And it's a YA biography, so it's a super, super fast read, uh, which is really cool. It's really interesting because like, it's not something that's like covered in your history books, and especially like for the kids that are really into anime and manga. Like, This might have gotten mentioned in something that you've watched. But, like, there's not a lot of information, like, more official and, like, reliable source in English. Also, um, Monument Men, or the greatest treasure hunt in the history, uh, the Monument Men. And it is the um, story of the group of men and women that, after World War II ended, were trying to find all the stolen art and different artifacts that the Nazis had taken and return it to their original owners. Uh, And it's pictures and like different stories of things that they found how they formed like stuff getting returned it's a chunky book and i like mentioned it to like a sixth grade class they got super into it that one's like really fun and really interesting and that's a topic that kids are familiar with because world war ii gets covered 
pretty much every year, I want to say like from middle school onward, they know some of it, but like this is like a part that they don't get to hear about. That's awesome. And it's got the like sort of treasure seeking bit, which is cool. Yeah, like there's pictures of like one of the coffins that was filled with like stolen artifacts in the book. That's like one of the things I always show. I'm like, look at this. They're like, oh, tell us more. I'm like, yes, now read the book. (laughs) One that I like, and I love to read different like with that book at different perspectives about something that you know a lot about and I like books about American history in the 1960s and there's one called Turning 15 on the Road to Freedom my story of the 1965 Selma Voting Rights March by Linda Blackman Lowry and she was a civil rights fighter she was jailed nine times before her 15th birthday and it's part of a story that we've all heard some of we know some of the basics of it but it gets into these specifics it gets into one person and it makes it so immediate and real and really not that long ago it's someone who is still around to tell their story of what happened and again this is YA so it's a pretty quick read and it's got a lot of pictures and everything in it so I really recommend that one. One book I like that I feel like also fits into that category is called The Port Chicago 50. And that book is all about the prejudice and injustice that Black men and women faced in America's armed forces during World War II. Everybody knows, you know, that World War II happened and the general events of what happened, but people don't realize how these people were treated during that time too. What happened in the book was a massive explosion happened during the Navy base at Port Chicago, and it killed 300 sailors at the docks. And 244 men refused to go back to work the next day until conditions were taken care of, and they weren't facing any unsafe conditions anymore. It just opens your eyes to like how Black men and women were treated during that time. I mean, they were almost giving their lives, you know, to fight for us in World War II, and they were treated so unfairly during it. And that book is also a graphic novel, too. And coming from somebody like me who isn't really a big history person, that's a fairly easy read with it being a graphic novel, and it's not too long either. I think that one's on my to be read list. Who's the author on that? I'd have to look it up. I didn't take note of any of the authors. The only reason I read it was because it was part of uh, the required reading for library school for my YA class, but I loved it. It's Steve Schenken, whose last name I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. He does awesome YA nonfiction on a strictly more informative, practical side. We just got in a new book called Don't Sit on the Baby, The Ultimate Guide to Sane, Skilled, and Safe Babysitting. It's a little handbook, but like I know probably a lot of teens are still babysitting as a way to make money, or even if it's just someone who has younger siblings who they're responsible for sometimes. It's a really handy little guidebook. And if you can't tell from the title, it's like trying to be a little bit funny, which I enjoy. It's really interesting. Some people don't think that they have handbooks for all those kinds of things. People like get a job babysitting and they don't think to like go to the library and get a babysitting handbook. So it's really interesting that we have books like that now. Also like stuff like that. Like you're like, okay, cool. I'll watch my neighbor's kid. But like the amount of other things that go into it that you don't realize of, okay, I'm going to watch the kid. Like I have to like make sure they have a snack. What are they allergic to? What should we do for entertainment? Like what am I doing with the kid to like keep them busy? Also, if something should happen, like, what do you do? Like, how do you handle that? Like, that would be covered. And, like, you're not like, oh, I'm going to, like, watch a kid and, like, especially as a teenager, plan for, like, worst case scenarios. But what if the kid you're watching does, like, choke on a slice of banana? What do you do? Reading a book and then, like, having that information of, like, here's some suggestions. That way you have that, like, information rattling in the back of your brain. It's really helpful instead of, like, oh, no, it's happened. I thought nothing about it. And now I'm panicking, like. That little voice can be like, remember the book. (laughs) This is what you should do. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And it's got lists of like, if 
you're worried that the kid is sick. At what point is it an emergency emergency? Like if their fever's over this or whatever, which honestly, as an adult, getting reminders on that stuff is useful because it is a lot of information. And hopefully we don't spend all of our time thinking about the worst things that could go wrong, but you need to have that information at hand if you're going to be responsible for a child. I think it'll also decrease the amount of emergency calls this child's parent is going to get to. I feel like if I was babysitting as a teen and something came up and I didn't know what to do, I'd like be calling my mom, I'd be calling the kid's mom, and what if they don't answer? Where do you do then? You Google it. Yeah, I babysat twice ever my entire life. I was like, all right, I have to get this kid off the bus get them a snack hopefully they do their homework i'm like i'm watching this kid for an hour like please don't let there be an emergency i was very lucky but i was like oh yeah probably should have known a bit more about babysitting before being like yeah i can like do this yeah if you decide to have a baby yourself they don't even give you a handbook then (laughs) it's definitely (laughs) useful information (laughs) you would think that they would give you one to take home with you or whatever giving a whole personal life that's so much responsibility. <laughs> so much. It's probably obvious by some of the stuff I'm talking about. I did also just browse the new shelf to see what had come in and looked cool, which is how I found that Don't Sit on the Baby book. But there's another one that is pretty new called Seeing Gender, an Illustrated Guide to Identity and Expression. It's a really, really interesting book, and it goes through the differences between, you know, sexuality and gender expression and uh, explains pronouns and neo pronouns. And I think it's really great to have a guide like this, because even if you're someone who has never thought about gender in any real way, like it's never personally been something that's occurred to you, but you still want to be informed so that you're kind and respectful to other people. It gives kind of an an overview on all of that. And I think that it's great if you do have any questions and you have started thinking about gender identity and sexuality and are trying to figure out what works for you, it can go through things. And it talks historically too about the different ways that gender has been perceived in society. There's a whole series and they're like tiny little books. I can't remember the name of the series that are um, different. Like there's um, the illustrated guide to they, them pronouns. There's like a whole series that are like, they're quite small, they're quick, they're really informative. They have a lot of details. Oh yeah, um, like the itty bitty like. So They're so small, they're so easy to lose. <laughs> <laughs> they're so good though. They are. Like, I feel like I have to go hunting for them because they like slide between books so easily. Yeah. But they're really good. They're just quick little bites of information and also being able to like come into the library and like you can sit down in the shelving and read it really fast and then shove it back on the shelf and disappear without anyone seeing you or like right i don't want anyone to know what i'm looking at i don't want my parents to see like search history i don't want to check out the book and make eye contact with the librarian and have them, right like, like we are not judging you we want you to find the information you need but that like teenager like inherent like don't look at me anyway and then on top of like oh no this is like a personal matter definitely don't look at me yeah yeah absolutely that quick little like i want the information i want no evidence that i looked up any of this information i don't want anyone to like acknowledge it or have any thoughts or opinions about it grab read it in the shelving put it back go we'll find the title of it and we'll make sure to link it on the book list for this episode i'm like find that series they come in and like they're so quick like like, i flip through them i read them i go this is great and then like cannot remember the titles because they're so quick and easy to read (laughs) i do like the wide range now of like ya nonfiction. like i feel like it used to just be like stuff for book reports and like hey i have to write a report on world war ii and now it's like fun things babysitting like tough topics lgbt gender and then also like musicians and stuff of like yeah yeah wide range and so much of the stuff that is in that book report or whatever the school project category is so legitimately yeah it's legitimately interesting to read it's laid out in such a good way yeah i remember like looking through and like i feel like there's nothing between elementary school level books and then adults when you're had to like write reports or like do research on things for such a long time we're like 
well, I can't read this book, it's for babies. <laughs> and then this book is like, kind of hard, because I'm not an adult yet. Yeah. And now there's also actually in the middle where you're like, oh, this is actually age appropriate. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to check out the Ocean County Library's website for more podcasts and events. All titles mentioned in today's episode can be found through the Ocean County Library, free with your library card. Until next time, happy reading. Happy reading.